I'm Philip Orbass. Uh, I'm an architect with about uh, 50 years experience and the last 25 have always been at least one preservation project on my desk mixed in with commercial and um, uh, residential projects. Um, I got involved in this project uh, because uh, it turned out that the church needed preservation attention desperately and um, we got the project rolling that way. Um, the reason that I uh, enjoy this church so much is the craftsmanship that could never be replicated today. Uh, the, the obvious pride in everything from uh, the stone, stone carving, wood carving inside, the, the simple planning. The architect who did this church did more than a hundred churches and other kinds of buildings through Massachusetts in his 40-year career. And this church um, has two sisters, one in Newport, Rhode Island, and the other one in Brattleboro, Vermont. Um, the contractor who's doing the second of two restoration um, attempts on the tower has worked on both of those other churches. So uh, it, it's, a, it's a, a whole group that really appreciates what uh, can never be duplicated. Gilbertville was started by uh, George H. Gilbert, who uh, was a mill owner in Ware. Um, Ware grew up as a water-powered mill town, focusing mostly on textiles. And um, when they ran out of uh, space to expand for another water power site, another dam, he bought 300 acres up in here in an area called the Harvard Gore, G-O-R-E. Uh, it's a deep ravine found, uh, surrounded by these hills. Um, and in, in 18, between 1860 and 1864, during the, really th through the whole Civil War period, he got three mills completely built, up and running, um, jet, um, weaving wool fabric for a multitude of purposes, including probably Civil War uniforms. Um, by 1867, he had the biggest mill, which you see down in the, in the hollow there. Um, and um, the company won... Um, uh, World's Fair gold medal prizes for their the quality of the various wool products that they made. Um, the company flourished right up until about 1910. This this little hamlet had a population of 2,000 people by then. Um, by the 19 teens, it was beginning to fade. A lot of the industry went south. There was less demand for wool fabric, and by about the late 1920s, the family, the third generation, had died uh, young, unfortunately. Um, and the uh, last of the senior Gilberts died, and the company just faded out by about 1930. Since then, the village has faded away. There was a tremendous flood in the 1938 hurricane that blew out the dam, and um, that was pretty much the end of the end of it. My name is Christopher Greenleaf. I've worked with the Stone Church for a few years, putting together music programs and some of the technical sides of it. I came to this building and to this glorious instrument uh, 87 or 88 at the invitation of Donald Boothman, who was about to found FOGO, Friends of the Gilbertville Organ, who then did quite a number of concerts for about a decade. There was a bit of a hiatus and then in 2015, Friends of the Stone Church came up. 2016, we launched our first concert. And uh, here we are now, uh, you know, five years later during COVID. In the 1860s and 70s, the United States was finding its way back on its feet after a costly and dangerous and very sad civil war. And one of the first things to happen was that the mill towns and villages of New England began to just burgeon. Out of that came a degree of wealth that not only built more mills and expanded the towns, but they had to build churches. And so in 1872, a, a congregation was founded here to build this building. Well, when you build a building like this, you've got to build an organ as well. They put tenders out to various organ builders, and we have some of that correspondence still. The winner was William Johnson of Westfield, and what he proposed to them was 
uh, no different than what wound up in many towns, villages, hamlets, even small cities. It was an organ straight out of the uh, factory catalog, but of course with small changes they negotiated to reflect the needs of this church. And among those needs would have been, for example, the beautiful chestnut facade. That is not out of the catalog at all. At all. And they would have fine-tuned details of the size of the instrument, the voicing, the, the general feel of it. And there is an amusing folk tale, which I believe is supported by correspondence. A lady organist in the 1870s very much wanted a center swell pedal because of the bulky dresses they wore and whatnot. And I gather that the wording of Mr. William Johnson on turning that request down very gently was that it would be very costly to push aside the tracker mechanism to allow a center pedal to be fitted. It would made the, make the pedal trackers more fallible. And so, Madame, would you please accept a swell pedal off to the right side? Well, the church heard the word cost, put their heads together in the decision to do the old style swell pedal on the side came to be. I'm Curtis Smith, music director at First Congregational Church in Shrewsbury, Massachusetts. Comparing an electro pneumatic action to a tracker action, uh, this one's quite a bit heavier than what I'm used to. Uh, what you get with an electro pneumatic action on uh, similar to the Casavant that I play uh, is a much lighter touch. And so there's a, a spring, uh, but that's pretty much it. Uh, with this, uh, yes, there's a spring, uh, but most of what you feel is actually air pressure. And your touch matters a little more when you're playing a tracker action organ uh, because you can let that wind in just a little bit faster or just a little bit slower, depending on the touch that you would like. Hello, we're here today at the Stone Church in Gilbertville, and this is an 1874 Johnson. And great thing about this organ, it has this stop right here, the bellows signal. When I pull this, back in the 19th century, it would raise a flag uh, so that people would begin pumping the organ usually just one person, uh, but today we have a switch. Let me turn those two on. Listen for the blower motor. And we get sound. So this is the open diapason. The facade pipes here in the front in the center panel are actually working pipes. can also activate stops by using these pedals. This is an early version of registration aids. This pedal on the left would be known as the piano pedal, and the pedal on the right would be the forte pedal. much like you would have on a, a modern instrument. It's a, a type of preset. The great thing about mechanical action organs is when I couple swell to great, the keys also move on the swell when I'm playing the great. Same thing works for the pedals. The pedal has its own 16 foot.
combined with our great sounds like this. Using my forte pedal, let's go for four, full organ. Full organ requires all my couplers. Well, um, this organ, I think I've been working on this organ since the late 90s. Um, there was a man a, by the name of Don Boofman at the time that was organizing concerts here and he has contacted me, had contacted me at that time to work on the organ and I've worked on it ever since. Don himself did some work on it, but whenever there was stuff that was beyond his uh, ability, he called me and uh, and then I worked on it, sometimes a mechanical problem, tuning of course, and so on. So this organ is mostly original. Um, what is not original is the wind system. There used to be, the very original wind system was probably a hand pump or a foot pump, and then there was a reservoir. That got changed, most organs got changed, uh, probably in the 1930s with electric blowers, got outfitted with electric blowers, which can be easily added to a hand or foot pump system. And, uh, and then this particular organ, the reservoir was taken out and smaller wind regulators got installed. That does have some advantages. For example, on a lot of these older tracker organs, the tracker action, the pedal action, the pedal coupler action, is very hard to get to, and uh, so by removing the wind reservoir, there's a little, a little advantage for the organ builder to be able to get at those things. Now, but most of it is original. The pipes are original, the wind chests are original, of course the case is original in chestnut, which is very rare. How did the, these original track organs derive their di diverse sounds that they have, the, di the different stops? Um, they're, they, that's done by using different materials, different shapes, and so on. And I have a couple pipes here which I'd like to show. We have uh, three different pipes here. This is a wooden pipe, and uh, it's part of the melodia. This is a tin pipe made from tin and lead alloy, which is part of the open diapason. And this one is a string is also made from um, tin. Now these all have the same pitch, but they don't have the same quality and the same volume. So you can see how by changing the diameter on a round pipe, and not so much the length, the length is about the same, by changing the diameter, we can get a stronger sound or a weaker sound. And then by, cha by changing the shape in the material, we can also essentially filter the overtones. That's essentially what's happening. The, the overtone composition is different depending on the material and the shape of the, the pipe. So here we are at the organ console, um, two keyboards. And, and here are the stops, stop knobs from the grate, stop knobs from the swell, and, uh, and then the pedal, just one pedal stop. Now let's talk about the action. We have taken out the music rack so we can see actually a little bit into the organ, but that's, it's all mechanical and every, every single key has its own tracker action. So here we're looking at the 
the swell action. If a key gets pressed out there, then this will move like that. This is a square. It, it trans, um, translates the horizontal motion into a vertical motion. And you can see how these have broken and many people have tried to fix them in their own creative way. Here, for example, uh, string and wood to make it work. Um, so all of this is still original. And uh, it's, we can also see we can also see how thin these things really are. You can imagine how easily these would break if with any kind of stress on them. So this is um, what we're looking at there is the great action. It's uh, fanning out from the keys because the wind chest is much wider than the keyboard itself, so they just spread out left to right like that. If I want something a little milder, I'll go for the swell because I have over here to my right an expression pedal with a mechanical linkage. It's actually a giant wood tracker similar to what you would see on the keys. Here, here it is with the swell box closed. Served in many ways. There isn't a lot of retail here. If you need an aspirin, you probably know whose house you can go to and knock on their door and find an aspirin. I think it's an absolute thrill and a joy to host the American Guild of Organists, the Worcester chapter, today and to see the enthusiasm of your members for the music and for this instrument. We learn, every time someone steps up to the keyboard, we learn more about the instrument and we share the joy of its offering. And the fact that we can make this a living work of art, that people can come in and, and continue, um, adds so much to the history of, uh, of what we offer. It's a unique resource for this building and it's a challenge for our organization we have a commitment to have at least one major recital each year. Typically it's in the fall and it's always named in memory of Donald Boothman. Uh, this was a tradition he started in favor of his friend David Huntress, who was the curator of the organ when Don came to Hardwick and was his great friend and David died quite young, uh, very tragically, and Don uh, launched his concert series with his first concert being the David Hunter's Memorial Concert. So this is our tradition that we now honor both David Huntress and Donald Boothman by having an organ concert every year. It is an honor of him. But we, we also try to feature the organ in many other programs and one of the most popular happy experiences has been hosting Peter Krasinski's silent films which are his own original improvised accompaniments uh, to silent films of his choosing and uh, our choosing, which we choose ones that aren't too scary and tend to have funny kind of family-oriented themes. So our next one will be Peter Pan, who we're releasing in January. Um, but what Peter has told us is that he takes his cue in his original accompaniment from the audience. And, and the joy of having an instrument like this is that the best way to experience this as live music and, and interactive music with the artists and there's just something special about live music that can't be recreated in spite of all the media and all the wonderful access that we have. So we do, we welcome the internet, we welcome your interviews because they offer an opportunity to reach people far beyond New England uh, and at the same time we invite that audience always to come and celebrate live live music with the organ being a proud jewel in that 
Many of the people who come to the Stone Church are from the immediate area where New Braintree, Gilbertville here, Hardwick, of which this is a, a town. And uh, I come from coastal Rhode Island. I'm a classical re recording engineer. I've worked for uh, close to 50 years recording mostly historic instruments. Uh, pianos, such as the beautiful 19th century instruments at the Frederick Collection, a lot of organs. I work in Germany, Alsace, Netherlands, recording organs. And um, it was my fascination with the Stone Church Johnson that brought me up a second and a third, and now, I don't know, a 70th time to record the instrument, to help people program it, to find organists who have that rare ability to understand an instrument like this and to play it. One of the challenges for a place like the Stone Church, of course, is simply surviving beyond the function of a church. Uh, how do we appeal to people to come into this now secular space with its very clerical feel? Uh, well, we have a beautiful parish hall named Boothman Hall after Don Boothman with uh, uh, even more beautiful acoustics than in here. And um, we are trying to become, if you will, a cultural center here. We hope to appeal to people who want to come to a place that has had a place in this community for just under a century and a half, and whose way forward could offer people um, a wonderful access to the way things once were, but relevant for our time.